Coming up in a second, we're going to talk tech. Matthew Dickerson's going to be with us and got some uh, new interesting stories about AI as well as some thermal imaging technology. If you've got any new gadgets that you've come across or that you've seen or you might have purchased, give us a ring. One three hundred eight hundred triple two. If you just want to talk about the virtues of AI or otherwise, you can give us a ring on that as well. One three hundred eight hundred triple two. All right, it's time to uh, talk tech. Matthew Dickerson is a small business consultant. He's the presenter of the Tech Talk podcast. Very good morning, Matthew. Very good morning to you, Pav. How are you going? Oh, I'm all right, thanks, mate. And you? Oh, fantastic, actually. A bit cold, but we're getting there. Slowly warming up. Can you do anything about that with your, your tech? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There are so many different ways to warm us up. There are so many bits of clothing now that are coming. In fact, I go bike riding each morning and I have heated socks controlled via Bluetooth from my phone. So there's tech all over the place to warm us up. You're kidding me. <laughs> no, they're great. Heated socks? No way. <laughs> Actually, if it's not cold enough, they're that warm that I'll be halfway through my ride and have to pull my phone out and just turn the heating down a little bit because they're a bit too, <laughs> bit too hot on my little toes. Mate, that, look, you may be overtaking it there a little bit, Matthew. <laughs> never, I did, never. I did, I, we hit a particularly cold morning last week, and I was wondering if there was such a thing as heated slippers. But uh, you've just answered that one. Yeah, well, this probably is. You know, I've still got socks. <laughs> Classic. Look, uh, I, the story I mentioned at the top here was all about the thermal technology, thermal imaging technology that's going to be available soon for night driving, which is a great story. Oh, look, I've got here that someone said swerving to avoid animal uh, rolls trucks, extending the reaction time is the ideal, hence the usual vast array of spotlights uh, do not work and 100 metres is too close still to make any difference. Now, it's a pretty interesting technology, this one, because it is goes a lot further than your headlights and can tell you basically if there's an animal or a human being for that matter within a fair distance of your car. It's a pretty exciting development. It is, and it's interesting when you say someone mentioned there the idea of swerving is dangerous. I know when I learned to drive, my dad used to say, only swerve for something bigger than you. So in other words, if a kangaroo comes out, brake, but don't swerve, because you might swerve to avoid a kangaroo, which is annoying when you hit a kangaroo, and you swerve to the other side of the road and hit a vehicle, which is obviously a bit more than annoying. So I totally agree with the comment there about swerving can be dangerous, but seeing further into the distance obviously is a really important thing. So we've got headlights, and the headlights seem to be getting better all the time, and you can see further. But thermal technology is really where I think car manufacturers are really going. And you just think about all the different safety features on a car now, Pav. It's quite incredible what we've got in terms of safety features. And sometimes you get in the car and you don't even realise some of the safety features you've got. You go to reverse out of a front end park and suddenly the steering wheel vibrates or a noise happens and, oh, there's one of those sensors that detects when cars are going past you from behind. So there's all these extra things. But night vision, in terms of where we're going now, is using technology that gives you the ability with very good accuracy to see something down the track. Now, 100 metres is about where they're getting to, which isn't too bad. I, I know one person mentioned there that that doesn't seem like it's far enough away. But that would give you, at 100 kilometres an hour, that would give you about 3.6 seconds to react. So if you saw something 100 metres away, 3.6 seconds is not too bad in terms of time to break and slow down to least not stopping, but maybe a much slower speed before you actually make impact compared to maybe if you only saw it yeah. 10 or 20 metres away. What, and, I mean, what does it look like? What do we do you just get a beep? Does, no, you, is you're talking about having a, a screen inside the car that actually yeah. would give you a night view of the road ahead. And it's getting very accurate to the point where you could not just make out there's something there, make out something very accurately. So whether it be a kangaroo, a cyclist, a pedestrian, the scary part is that pedestrian deaths have increased by 19% over the last three years. So that's a and that's a worldwide figure, so that's a bit scary. But and then why why has that happened? Do we know? Yeah, I don't know whether more and more people are getting out there, whether people are driving cars more. I'm not sure why, but that's a pretty scary number. And three quarters of all pedestrian fatalities occur after dark, which kind of makes sense. People are yeah. out after dark, and and those pedestrian deaths, I think, include cyclists as well. They often include. Uh, cyclists and those pedestrian deaths and I, I saw it the other night I was coming home and it was after dark and I could just see a little flash in front of me 50 or 60 meters or so and I just slowed down I didn't know quite what, what, what it was and then as I got a bit closer I realized it was the bottom of the pedals of someone in front of me and again that was all they had they had no rear light there was just that little reflection of that little reflector at the bottom of the pedals but it was very easy to miss because as the pedals went up and down, you could just see a little bit there. If I had night vision and a 
systems in, inside my car to see that, it would have been a cyclist on the side of the road and it would have been very easy to see them riding along. So it's certainly something that we'll see and we're getting vehicles already, we're getting some of the big manufacturers already starting to install this now. It's just as it gets better and better and again we'll see things on luxury cars, on high-end vehicles and it doesn't seem to take long now for those luxury features that you pay extra money for to then get to the stage where they're on all vehicles. So hopefully yep. this will start to come fairly quickly. And keep in mind, it'll go through fog and smoke as well. So it's not just about seeing it in nice, clear view, because fog can be a bit scary, and people think, it's okay, I'll drive in the fog, I can go reasonably quickly. It's okay if there's nothing that happens out of the ordinary. Where fog gets a bit scary is if anything happens someone on in the front of you, a pedestrian, someone going across the road, a car that's broken down in front of you, that all would be seen by night vision. We had a call just before from a truck driver driving through Colac who's saying there's fairly dense, thick fog in that part of the world. So imagine would have been handy there. Look, uh, Roger's called. If you want to join the program, one three hundred eight hundred triple two. Talking about new technology. If there's any uh, that you've got that you've been playing with or that you've seen or you've read about, love to hear it from you. One three hundred eight hundred triple two. Roger's called about this particular issue. G'day, Rog. G'day, mate. Hey. Uh, there's a company here in WA that run in the northwest uh, overnight, and they've been running thermal imaging cameras for at least six years that I know about. Because we we get a lot of cattle in the northwest, and it just saves so much in on insurance and truck repairs and things like that. So it's been around for a while. I'm sure but it has. Have you, are you driving a truck with thermal imaging, Roger? Uh, I don't. I I was looking into it because I was doing a bit in the northwest, but I just changed my driving hours because I think it was about eight grand to set the truck up and. Uh, and I wasn't going to be doing it that long, so I just changed my yeah. driving hours and my habits. But these guys who run in Northwest, I think they run about four or five trucks in the Carrara and Headland every night. So they've been running them for years. It makes economic sense to them because, yeah, it's very costly to repair a truck, you know, hit a cow. Well, it, it can be up, if you hit a cow, it can be up to 100 grand depending on the truck. Yeah. So. Yeah. And how, how dangerous, I mean, because you've driven that road a bit, how dangerous is it at night? Um, do, you, do you find yourself all of a sudden in situations where it would have been handy having the, the thermal imaging? Uh, yeah, yeah, but I, I've been lucky that it, occasionally I'll, I'll get a cow walk across the road, but sort of uh, I, I was leaving early in the morning and cattle would tend to sleep, so I had a pretty good run, but... Um, late afternoon, early evenings, yeah. they seem to be on the move, so you've really got to be careful. Look, kangaroos around sunset, I mean, you know, so uh, the sun's coming down low in the sky, the visibility's not necessarily that good, so, I mean, I imagine this sort of technology would be pretty handy for that too, that time of day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't go into Kimberley and the Pilbara that much, so um, where I do travel, it's, it's mainly just kangaroos, and yeah. if, if they're running the truck, they're running the truck. But uh, but uh, as um, as your guest was saying, it, you don't swear for them, sort of thing. And um, but they make a bit of a mess. Yeah, I'm sure they but, do. Yes. Uh, they, they, it's the cattle that you really worry about because they're just so big. And and a guy died in the Kimberley just a couple of weeks ago from hit, hitting a cow with his four wheel drive. So. It's yeah, so no. much damage that they you can cause. Hit a big animal like that at high speed, uh, you're probably going to come off the road. So you're right, Roger. Incredibly dangerous for, well, obviously for the cows, but for the drivers as well, and expensive. So uh, thanks for your call, mate. Nice to hear from him. Cheers, mate. Appreciate it, So look, I've got another one here. Trucky Robbo says we have the FLIR infrared cameras on our road trains. They're fantastic. Horses, cattle, camels and roos. Two are so easy to see. There you go. And so, Pav, what's interesting there, you mentioned headlights. One of the great things about these is they're not affected by headlights. You'll still see that thermal image on the headlight, even though, as you see, a headlight come towards you. Sometimes that can limit your vision. Sometimes I'll find myself driving and I'll just slow down a bit as a car comes because you get a fairly limited view. And if there's nothing that comes out in front of you on your side of the road, everything's okay, but it's if something changes. So it's interesting. We have seen this technology around since about 2005 in a limited form. It actually goes back to the 1991 Gulf War that was originally developed. This sort of technology, this thermal sensing technology, goes back to there. But as with so many things in wartime, things were developed quickly for wartime. 
And it was only after that technology was declassified that we started to see it used in things like firefighting and things like vehicles. I think the point here is that you do get truck drivers, you do get vehicles with it now, but it'll start to get to the stage where it becomes common fare, but it's also getting much better, getting much more accurate in what it can see. And we heard $8,000, which is quite pricey, but I imagine that as we get further along, the price will come down as unit costs do when they get more popular, these things. Look, I got, Tony wanted to say, does the thermal imaging blind oncoming vehicles, which it doesn't, it sounds like, if you're saying it's separate to the headlight system? It is indeed. It's a separate system altogether. It, it doesn't blind anything. What it's doing is actually sensing the heat. So it's looking at the heat signatures, but because it's getting so much more accurate, that's where it can give you more accurate images. And you've probably seen imaging that's thermal imaging. So people have probably seen things on TV, on on movies, whatever, that shows some various different colours of things that are showing heat signatures. But this is doing the same thing except much more accurately. So you're not just getting blobs and you don't really know what it is, you're getting much more accurate shapes so that you can make out that it's a cyclist or a kangaroo or a cow, whatever it might be, it's getting much more accurate. And as technology progresses, you see that where you get more accuracy out of it. I'm thinking of the uh, movie Predator, uh, where the alien has a bit of thermal imaging technology (laughs) and Arnold Schwarzenegger covers himself in mud. Yeah, that that type of thing where you're trying to change your heat signature. (laughs) Yep, that's the way. Uh, Tony actually wanted to say, does it help? Can you see e-scooters in the dark? Because <laughs> yes. they're impossible to see at the moment. <laughs> uh, yes, it does. The Not so much the e-scooter, but the human on the e-scooter. The e-scooter itself, if it was left on the side of the road, for example, probably would be a pretty similar temperature to the things around it, but it would probably still make out something slightly different. But definitely a human on the e-scooter would make a difference. I wonder how to go with cars because the car engine or truck engine is has a heat signature and I wonder if it picks that up as well. Yeah, definitely. So it really is just looking at the temperature of the surroundings and comparing it to the temperature of individual objects in the surroundings. So absolutely, you would pick up a car and that's good if there was a car broken down on the side of the road in fog, for example, it would pick up that. There you go. That's a bit uh, easy to detect, though, Pav, because it's a pretty big object. So yes. you definitely see that on the heat signature. It's really the small animals, the humans, whether it be cyclists or pedestrians, on the side of the road. It's really those sort of things that it's going to make a difference with. I've got two texts here. One from James. Uh, sorry. Uh, one from it is from Dave. He says, more people are getting hit these days because they have their earbuds in. They walk straight <laughs> in front of you. And the other one is from... Uh, Daniel says, uh, or from Milkman Dan, says infrared is great improvement, but there is a correlation between pedestrian deaths and the use of noise-cancelling headphones. Yeah, so both, both talk theory. about those fact that those earbuds and mm-hmm. people are a bit disconnected, aren't they? Sometimes you just have people put their earbuds, especially noise-cancelling should be better because noise-cancelling should take out that background noise, but you'll still hear something like a horn or something that's a bit different, but just people playing music, loudly that can obviously make a huge impact and people do sometimes step out on the road just walking through the streets without any obvious sign they've actually checked for cars and before you know it there's a car on top of them Mm. so maybe that's the reason we can only theorize about that stuff uh i'll just just quickly last point on this one because i've got a car that beeps when i reverse or when i get close and then i get into our other car a spare car uh, and it doesn't beep and (laughs) when you're in the old car you sort of get used to it. It's unbelievable, actually. There's been a number of times when I've been in the car that doesn't beep and thought, oh, <laughs> I'm a little bit close for comfort here. I was waiting for the beeps. It's amazing how quickly you become reliant on this stuff, Matthew. I worry, Pav, about my kids who all did their driver's licences in cars that had reversing cameras. So when you had to do parallel park yeah. and that type of thing, it's so much easier. And I do get a bit scared if they just got into a car that had something as simple as not having a reversing camera, I'm not sure they could actually park the car, Pav. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's all going to be automated soon anyway, Matthew, isn't it? Well, there are some cars that do that, but that's the problem. You get back in an older car and how would you manage to automatically park the car? And what, I've got to park this manually? I've got no reversing camera? How could I possibly drive this car? Even driving a manual car may be a thing of the past that was in the future, Matthew. I think so. Yeah. Uh, look, one three hundred eight hundred triple two. We're talking all about new technologies. If you've got any that you've come across, read about, or that you purchased, love to hear from you. One three hundred eight hundred triple two is the number to call. One three hundred eight hundred triple two. The text number zero four three seven 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 four seven seven four.
This month, find a brand new collection of audiobooks on the ABC Listen app, including international bestseller The Book Thief by Marcus Suzak. I do, however, try to enjoy every colour I see. A billion or so flavours. And the book that inspired the movie and TV series Ladies in Black. The Night of the Black Nightdress and Frank's disappearance might in fact be connected. Find these audiobooks and many more for free on the ABC Listen app. We're talking to Matthew Dickerson this morning, small business consultant and presenter of Tech Talk, the podcast, all about uh, new technologies. We've been specifically talking about the thermal imaging technology that's going to be available for night driving soon. That's going to improve our, our safety and improve our quality of travel. I'm still getting a lot of texts about this, Matthew, so I'll read a couple of these to you. Um, someone wanted to say, this is Shane in Mansfield, said thermal imaging is good, a good idea but it will just be another screen to distract the driver. Modern vehicles have far too many gadgets in them and distract us from the most important tasks of looking at the road ahead. That's a sort of good point, really. Sometimes, yeah, there's, there's a fair bit going on with this technology and maybe it distracts us from the real job of driving sometimes. And I think the point you made before about things beep and there's noises and sometimes you get to the stage with so many different things in your car making noises at you that you start to tune out to them. So the important noises that you might want to hear or things you might want to look at, sometimes they just become background noise. So you might have your car beep when you get close to the speed limit or it beeps when it sees something or beeps when you're reversing and suddenly it's just beeping always and you just ignore them all. Hmm. I've got a text from a different Alex, this one, who says, uh, would the infrared only be suitable in the country without too much around, i.e. too much info in the city? Yeah, how would the infrared thing go... When you're driving down a, a city street, it's got people on either side of the road. There'd be thermal imaging uh, coming up everywhere, I would have thought. It'd be hard to determine which what's what. Well, it would show you the same as a camera would show you. It would show you those along the side of the road. Any noise or any beep or any alert would only come into or would only be activated when it would come into your view. So if you're coming into the forward direction on the roadway, for example. But the advantage is you can see it. So the same as you're driving down a city street, in daytime, you can see various people on the side of the road, on the footpaths, looking at cyclists maybe in front of you, e-scooters as someone mentioned, and then if you were doing that at night time, it gives you a much clearer view of all of that. But I suppose it's more relevant on highway driving because that's when you do tend to find some of those animals or potentially cyclists, yeah. pedestrians coming out at you. But it would, it would give you that clearer view wherever you were, city or country. I suppose the other thing with the country driving is you're driving at high speeds. So, Correct. Uh, the delay times and reaction times are all factored into this. Look, uh, also, uh, this is an interesting one. Apparently there's a trial with a helmet being used that uses and interacts with eyes and that has setting for interactions with craft. Do you know anything about that one? Yeah, I have seen ones where they actually can use either sensors on your dash and look where your eyes are looking to see what you're looking at, or I've seen ones where it is a helmet as well. Obviously, it's going to be hard to get people to get in the car and put a helmet on to go driving, but there, there are some cameras that can be set up or that have been tested on a dash, just look where your eyes are looking to see if you might be missing something. So you're looking out to the left when something comes from the right. That would be a slightly different alert to if you're looking to the right when something comes to the right. So looking where your eyes are looking, plus it gives you that advantage that it can actually detect if your eyes are getting a bit droopy. So if you're getting a bit yep. sleepy, that can be detected as well. And there's some also in the some uh, engines or some devices within the car itself can actually pr predict that stuff, can't it? They can tell if you're feeling a bit drowsy off the... It, it even happens in my car. I think if you're just driving for long enough, a little message comes up, you know, take a break if you're feeling sleepy. Yeah, th those ones there that you mentioned in your car are just timed, so they go for a certain amount of time and then start giving you a warning to say it's time to take a break. So they're not actually sensing that, but there are sensors. Even just the way you're steering, just the movements yeah. in your steering wheel, there's work being done on detecting when someone's drowsy, how they might change their steering, just slightly slower in the way they might steer. But again, AI is used behind the scenes with a lot of this, where they'll just feed a huge amount of data into AI, and then it can start to make predictions based on what you're doing at the moment. Uh, Judy's got a good solution for us. Good morning, Judy. Normal. Um, look, I, I've done that. The, ca the, ca the kangaroos you come up by are just the enormous ones. Yeah. And the thing is, I try to find a motel or a hotel. I mean, some hotels are not too good, but I tried it to stay there overnight. And so 
start off early, not too early in the morning, because they're still around when they really go at the, the, the dusk. As, uh, again, the, the kangaroos come out a lot, you know. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's uh, it's a real issue for driving at dusk and dawn. Um, so, if this yeah. improves, that that's good. But yeah, Judy's solution is just to get into a motel. <laughs> I like your solution, Jude. Not too many kangaroos in motel rooms no. that I've seen lately. <laughs> One of the real challenges, though, Pav, is when you talk to companies that are developing autonomous driving, which gets a bit scary for people when there's no one sitting in the driver's seat. When you talk about those companies, one of the real challenges is a kangaroo. They've done lots of testing for various animals around the world, which are all similar in that they walk or run, but they're fairly much stable in terms of the the mass of the body across the ground. Whereas a kangaroo, because it's hopping, there's some, some problems with picking up that because it can see an animal, but then as the kangaroo hops, it can't see the animal, and then it can see the animal. So mm. that's actually a real challenge for all these companies out there developing autonomous driving for the detection of a kangaroo because it is up and down in the air. And look, I don't. there's probably hardly a driver in Australia that hasn't had an encounter with a kangaroo on the road at some point. Mm. It's a pretty very common thing. Uh, someone would say, in fact, the, there's a Westpac helicopter apparently has new technology that's connected with the helmet uh, and has a screen display. So I suppose this stuff would not just be for driving as well, this thermal imaging stuff, pretty handy for pilots as well. Well, absolutely right. Um, Airports already use it now, so when they're trying to see out maybe through fog on an airport, then that's used. So it's used in a whole range of ways. I suppose the real point with this tech is just the accuracy is getting so much better. can see further, can see more accurately, and can detect smaller differences in temperatures. So that's where you start to get those better detection of not blobs, but of more accurate shapes. Yep. I've got a text here from Richard who says that we're about to buy a new car with all sorts of driver aids after a 10-year-old patrol. Not looking forward to it, you know, <laughs> driving the old patrol. So, uh, Richard, look, I uh, uh, could improve your quality of life there. <laughs> Matthew would probably argue that as well. Oh, look, I would, absolutely. Too much technology is never enough, Pav, I would say. But, <laughs> but it is a bit daunting sometimes, and sometimes you don't even discover some of the features in your car until you've been driving it for a while or someone else mentions it. I Actually, one I, I really like is intelligent cruise control. You're getting more and more vehicles coming out with intelligent cruise control. So most people are familiar with cruise control, but you don't use cruise control typically around city streets. You're not trying to get it to a speed and sit on that speed. There's too many things that are happening. But intelligent cruise control is a great way to make you safer, but also save points in your license because all it does is gives you an upper limit. So you might set it to 60 kilometres an hour if you're in a 60k zone. And as you drive, you put your foot in the accelerator, it'll get you up to 60 but won't go over. If there's an emergency where you've really got to get past something, an animal comes out and you need to accelerate for whatever reason, you can slam your foot to the ground on the accelerator and it will still accelerate, but generally it just holds you on that 60 k's an hour. So it's a great way to keep that speed. So little things like that, you might not even be aware it's there. You find that and you add that to your driving experience. Richard, you'd be happy to know I've got a little. Uh, we've got a thing in the car. If we head over this, go over the speed limit at all, it says you you you're going over the speed limit. Uh, it also does a little thing that says you're approaching a red light camera. <laughs> so, <laughs> are they pretty handy things to have, Richard? So uh, that'll be coming with your new car, no doubt, when you get there. Uh, Chris has called from Shell Harbour. Good day, Chris. There you go, Rob. Yeah, good. Thanks, mate. How about you? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Excellent. I'm just ringing up in regards to the conversation about the pilots with the heads-up display on their helmets and things like that. Yeah. Um, I remember watching on, I think it was Current Affair or 60 Minutes a couple of months ago, about, uh, you know, some pilots and they had some, uh, there was actually some uh, fatalities due to these helmets. There was faults with them and, you know, all overloading with information and, and you know, sort of put the pilots in a bit of a, a disarray of what was actually going on, so... Mm. It yeah. was uh, yeah, it was quite scary actually. Without seeing the piece, were they helicopter pilots or? Yeah, they were actually army defence, I think. So okay. yeah, they were actually yeah, it was their dad was on there. His son was one of the uh, one of the gentlemen that lost his life fighting these helicopters and things like that. And yeah, just with his new heads up display, that it was a uh, yeah proven faults and that in there. But uh, yeah, nothing sort of you know it's going through courts and that from my understanding. Huh. I'll just ask Matthew, do you know anything about that story, Matthew? I haven't seen that one where, and I suppose with any technology, there's potential for it to not work on day one and hopefully there's enough testing before it's out in the field. I would have hoped that 
the amount of testing that was done before pilots were using it. I mean, heads-up display has been available for pilots, for fighter pilots, for people in the military for some period of time now. So I, I don't know about that one in particular, but I suppose that's always a problem with technology. You're hoping that it's improving the lives of everyone. Hopefully it's making it safer for everyone. Of course, you can always get problems with any technology and sometimes, unfortunately, it does go wrong. Look, I've got a bit of information here, Chris, for you and for you as well, Matthew, that Mick's just put up on the page here. Uh, Australia Defence has confirmed pilots on the new or the now retired Taipan helicopter fleet were using a helmet mounted display system despite internal warnings the equipment carried an increased risk when used in flying conditions with poor visibility. In a formal response to Parliament, the Department has revealed official Army test findings before last year's fatal crash off Queensland had highlighted dangerous faults associated with the software on the device. So it looks like, yes, that Chris, there were uh, serious concerns there. So thank you for ringing up and telling us about pointing that out. No, that's all right. No worries at all. Have a great day. You too, mate. Cheers. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Yeah, and no, Pab, I the other one on, now, Matthew. Sorry, the other one on heads-up display, again, not that you're putting a helmet on, but many cars are now coming with heads-up display that reflects items or information onto your windscreen. And I find yep. that incredibly handy because you're looking at the road ahead and again, sometimes you're checking on things like your speed, having that displayed as you look through the windscreen, that gives you a, a really good visual reference. Even with sat-nav, when you've got sat-nav in the car, I mean, many probably people probably use their phones, but if you're still using sat-nav in your car, again, that heads-up display can show which turn you're meant to make next, how far away it is, so you're not looking down at a dash, which just takes your attention away from the road just for a few seconds. Mm. And when you're travelling along at 100 kilometres an hour, you're doing about 28 metres every second. So if you glance down at something for a second, and a second is a fairly long time to glance down for, but that's 28 metres you just travel without actually looking at the road. So the more you can look at the road through a heads-up display, yeah. for example, the safer that is. Well, I don't know. I reckon if there were things flashing on the, on the windscreen in front of me that would put me off almost. So I don't know about that one. Um, well, I have seen it, obviously. It will be interesting to see when they roll that, that out if uh, we get any problems with it. Look, I've got a text here from Annie who says, we're not driving F-35 Super Hornets. <laughs> <laughs> I love my pre-computerised Volvo. It's got everything. When I get a new car, it will be another old Volvo. Annie, well, and that's Annie a great example. Volvo, of course, gave the world seatbelt. So what a wonderful piece of technology. In fact, <laughs> I would say that is the single greatest piece of technology in a vehicle at the moment to have saved more lives than anything else. And of course, Volvo developed that. Don't hold me to this, but late 60s, I think it was, they developed that. And they actually said, we've developed this, it's our product, but it's too important for the world. So they basically gave that to the rest of the car manufacturers around the world. Yeah, I remember that story. That's a great story. There you go. Annie, Annie the Volvo driver had the last say on that one. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> uh, just quickly, got this one here. Side issue, but why are the new road signs so dazzling? They're worse than oncoming cars with lights on high beam. Surely we need to dull these down a bit. The older signs are perfectly fine, says Harry. I'm not, uh, sure, the, the, I'm not sure the new signs are particularly dazzling. They might be brighter when a new sign's installed compared to an old sign that's been there for a long time. But I think that's more a reflection of the headlights, excuse the bad pun, yeah. that the fact that you've got brighter headlights now, those signs might seem more dazzling, or again, if you compare new to old. But I don't know there's any technology in particular that makes road signs better or brighter as such. Oh, someone says, in some smart cars, when using the GPS and cruise control, the alarm goes off when driving through a school zone 24-7, says Eddie. Um, mine's usually pretty accurate with that stuff. And I'm often amazed, how do they factor in all this stuff? How do they know that the school hours or school holiday dates and all of this stuff must be put into some central computer that feeds it back out into all the vehicles on the road. It's pretty amazing technology. It is, and you do still get the frustration during holidays, which obviously New South Wales is in school holidays at the moment. You still get that frustration where you'll drive yeah. through a school zone in holidays and there's no school there and it'll still tell you that you should be doing 40 k's an hour. So you've got that problem there. And some cars don't even know that it's night time. Some cars do, but yeah. then the school holiday one's a bit trickier. Bill's called. G'day, Bill. Go on, mate. Hey, going. You've got a truck with all the sort of these uh, high fancy, high tech gadgets in it, have you? Yeah, mate. Yeah, I'm in a quad, uh, an ultra quad. I, would, I do FIFO work over in WA, Port Hedland. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we've got all the stuff. We've got the thermal uh, camera, and, and that's fantastic. You can pick up you know, even a snake on the road. You can see. Really. 
Yeah. Wow. Um, and, th- and then plus I got the infrared that watches my eyes. But one thing, um, like you've been talking about that you can see in fog, well, not with this one. Okay. You, you can't see nothing in fog. <laughs> so what do you see, Bill? Like if there was a snake on the road, what, what do you actually see? You've got a little screen that... Yeah, you've got a little screen. It's all like six inches or so um, across. And how do you know um, that it's not a kangaroo and it's a snake? Oh, you can see kangaroos. You can, you can make out, like, because um, we've got a lot of cows over here. All right. So you can see, it makes out, like, because what it is, it comes up really white. And the, and the hotter the, 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 the animal, the brighter it comes up. Okay. So you, you've got the full outline. You can, yeah. Hey, aren't, can aren't snakes cold-blooded? Um, yeah, but you got. Well, it doesn't get cold much over here. <laughs> I wonder, anyway, that's very interesting, Bill. So anyway, you reckon it's improved your quality of work, your, your driving, and made things safer for you? Oh yeah, yeah. Like, because uh, I worked for a company before that didn't have a camera, and I and, and I was only there eighteen months, and I hit about three cows. Huh. I've been here with this company now. Uh, over three years, and haven't hit one. Huh. There you go. There's, a, there's proof in the pudding right there, Matthew. Thank you, Bill, for telling us about that. Very interesting. Uh, it looks like it's a, it's work for Bill, Matthew. Yeah, that's right. And you did mention fog there, but certainly that's where the new ones are getting better again, where they can see images in fog. And it's a good point you make with snakes. Snakes are being cold-blooded. Basically, they can't regulate their body temperature like a human can but they'll typically be a similar temperature to the environment. So they'll try and get out into the environment. In summer, for example, they'll go and have a nice little bake out in the sun and and get to that same temperature. So typically you'll find they'll be similar to their environment, but not exactly the same. And that's where these cameras are getting so much better. Now we've got to wind it up, Matthew, because news is coming up. Great talking to you again. We'll catch you again in a month's time, okay? Thanks, Pav. Matthew, much appreciated.